This is lecture 17. We'll be covering guard strengthening. Guard strengthening is a way to take the predicates that we've developed uh, in each place preceding a transition and uh, kind of reducing them, weakening them effectively uh, in order to uh, kind of reduce the, uh, reduce the size of the circuit, implement a more efficient circuit, uh, and kind of avoid over specifying uh, the rules in order to drive transitions. Um, actually, there are two approaches to this. One is guard strengthening, where we start with a an unspecified guard, right? One basically true, uh, and then we add things to it uh, until we get to some minimal required specification. The other is guard weakening, where we start with the fully specified guard and remove things from it until we get to a minimally specified guard. Uh, I'll only be presenting guard strengthening uh, rather than guard weakening, uh, but you can imagine that guard weakening looks very similar. Okay. So previously, we have taken a CHP specification. Uh, this is the same CHP specification that was presented uh, in the last lecture. Uh, we uh, generated a reshuffled handshake expansion from them uh, and then run them through uh, HSE SIM and HSE encoder to uh, do state variable insertion so that we can have a uh, fully specified state space, right, with unique encodings for each place. Uh, and now we're going to take this HSE that we've developed and uh, build production rules from it. And so we have this, we have our state space, right, as uh, rendered by HSE SIM. And we're going to start with um, uh, one transition in particular. Uh, it doesn't matter which, but we'll, uh, we'll start this with V2 up. If we look at the place before V2 up, then we'll see that we have uh, a predicate, right? We have L.R and L.E and not R.R and V1 and not V2. Uh, so generally, we can take this predicate and just stick it into the guard of a production rule, uh, except for kind of one caveat, and that is that a production rule cannot be self-invalidating. Uh, so if you look at this and not V2, then the moment that we, we get past the threshold voltage here on the V2 up, it will invalidate the guard and will no longer be driving V2. And so V2 will not make it all the way up to VDD. So we need to remove that uh, last little bit and not V2. And now we have a uh, not CMOS implementable, but legal production rule. Um, and we'll get to CMOS in implementability in the next lecture and kind of how to uh, make that happen. Uh, but for now, we're just trying to get a set of production rules that implement this circuit. So uh, rather than starting with this fully specified production rule, rule we're going to back it all the way up to true yields V2 up. And we're going to start looking for uh, terms that we need to add in in order to kind of make sure that this transition only fires in this semicolon before the transition. So the first thing that we look at is we look at the state, at the place, before uh, and at the transition before that semicolon, right? So uh, we're trying to build a production rule for this semicolon, and so we're just walking our way back through this HSE. And we're going to check to see, all right, does this production rule fire in this place? And if it does, and it shouldn't, then we need to add in a term in order to prevent this production rule from doing so. So we're looking at this uh, place, and if we take this guard, one, and this encoding, then we get this encoding, which is valid, right? It's, we get basically every, uh, every uh, value of every variable in this predicate is uh, allowed basically in this uh, guard. And so it will, this production rule will, will fire in this place as it stands. So that means we need to go back through the set of transitions between this place and this place 
in order to see what we can add in to kind of disambiguate um, the guard from this uh, encoding, right? And so right now, the only transition in between is r dot r down. So we can add that into the guard, right? Not r dot r. And now we know for a fact that this guard will not pass in this place, right? This production rule will not, will not fire because we know that r dot r is high in this place. And we know that r dot r is low in this place. And the guard is now not r dot r. And so it won't fire in this place and it will fire in this place still. So now we're gonna keep doing that, right? We're gonna, we're gonna keep walking back through this HSC and picking that you know, transition that allows us to disambiguate the guard from that state. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, previous uh, semicolon. And we see that the encoding in the semicolon still has r dot r high. And so this production rule will not fire, will still not fire in this place, right? We're still good. So we, can, we don't need to add anything new. Okay, so we keep going. And now we're in this place and r dot r is still high. So this production rule still won't fire, which is good. And we keep going. And r dot r is now low. So now this guard will fire in this place when it shouldn't. And we need to add a term uh, in order to kind of disambiguate this guard from this place. And so if we look back through the set of transitions, uh, we see uh, we have v1 up, we have r dot, we have not r dot e, we have r dot r down, right? But in general, we want to pick the one that's closest to where we are, because uh, that will give us the most likelihood of uh, it eliminating more states uh, downstream. It's and this is mostly a heuristic, right? This is not uh, guaranteed. This is just it seems to work that way in general. So if we go look at V1 up, we'll notice that uh, that disambiguates this production rule from this guard, right? V2, V1 is low in this, and, and it's uh, one, it's high in this. And so if we add it into the guard, we get V1 and not R dot R yields V2 up. Okay, so keep in mind, this is still not CMOS implementable. We'll cover that in the next lecture. All right, so let's keep going. So then we get to this state and uh, r dot r is low and v1 is low. So if v1 is low, it doesn't pass this guard. So we're still good. So then we get to here and we have uh, r dot r is low and v1 is low. Again, v1 doesn't, doesn't allow uh, this place to pass the guard. So we're still good. Uh, then we get to here, and we see that v1 is low. Again, still good. v1 is low, and now we get to here. And you'll notice that we get to, uh, we've just passed v2 down. And so in every single one of these other states, v2 is allowed to be high. Right, so this production rule is allowed to fire vacuously, in all of these places. And you'll see that in the encoding. Uh, if you were to look at each of these encodings, they all have V2 being one. So now we can just iterate on this uh, for all the different transitions, right? So let's take a look at an example that has multiple possible firings. Uh, and in particular, we're gonna look at R dot R down. Right, so R dot R down, uh, if we look at this firing, we get this production rule, V1 and not R dot E, right? And then if we look at this firing here, we get this production rule, not L dot E and not R dot E. So we need to create a combined production rule that fires on both of these, but that doesn't end up creating a new ambiguity, right? Creating a new conflict between the two production rules. 
And so for this production rule, we can do that just by oring them together, right? We don't run into any extra considerations, thankfully. The thing that is still yet to figure out, so we have um, a guard strengthening algorithm implemented in an old version of HSE's PRS. Now that guard strengthening algorithm is good for every case that is a single firing, right? But the moment that we start getting multiple firings, uh, that that algorithm that, that is implemented falls apart because uh, I still haven't figured out how to effectively do that um, disambiguation when combining production rules yet. Uh, when doing so, it involves, for example, knowing which conditional branch you're coming from or knowing which parallel branch you're coming from or all, you know, you get all sorts of weird things. And so that is kind of a to do, right? Um, what is described in the literature is what I've just presented you, no more than that. So uh, this is kind of where the literature leaves off. Okay. So, right, we start running into issues, sequence transitions, uh, parallel transitions, conditional transitions, uh, and then we need to be able to disambiguate conflicting rules when we combine them uh, together across each of those cases. And of course you can get combinations of these things. So you can get two transitions that are related across not just parallel, um, uh, you know, a, a parallel composition, but also, uh, you know, a conditional con composition as well. Okay, so if we keep doing that, we generate production rules for each of the transitions in this HSE specification. And you'll notice that we still have a long way to go before this is a viable circuit, right? Um, all, every single one of these gates are currently state holding, which is going to be very inefficient. Uh, there isn't really room for any statusizers in any of these gates. Uh, none of these gates are actually CMOS implementable. They're, uh, they go every direction possible. Uh, reset hasn't been generated for this. Uh, and, you know, so these are all the problems that we have yet to solve effectively in this uh, algorithm. And there's kind of one more little piece, which is uh, how do we either reshuffle this or work with state variable insertion in order to try to reduce the number of state holding gates. What heuristics are there to do that? Um, and then what can we do to make sure that these gates are indeed CMOS implementable? Okay, so now here's what's implemented. We have two tools. One is CHP to HSE, and one is HSE to PRS. CHP to HSE is a templating tool. It takes a given uh, uh, template specification of a CHP and expands it into HSE. It doesn't do any HSE reshuffling at all. So it's just a, a flat expansion. Um, and it, it actually leads to pretty poor circuitry. Uh, HSE to PRS implements all the basic al algorithms down to uh, uh, all the way down past guard strengthening and into bubble shuffling, which we'll talk about next lecture. Uh, but there are a lot of cases that are not covered in each of those algorithms. And so these are earlier versions of Haystack, uh, and it has a semi functional guard strengthening implementation. I intend to uh, move that guard strengthening implementation over to Haystack in its own executable. Uh, so that we can start uh, developing on it at some point uh, later in the future. Okay, so if you wanted to uh, run this particular HSC through this tool chain, you would first need to specify uh, the channel type uh, here, right, that, that dictates the channel protocols. Then you need to uh, specify the uh, stream uh, process specification with the HSC along with its environment. And then when you run this through CHP to HSE, 
and then run it through HSC to PRS, you'll end up with this output. Right? And this is exactly the same output that I presented in the lecture. Uh, it's just we've added uh, reset rules and we've added some syntax to make it simul simulatable through PRSIM. Uh, so you'll need to, if you want to sim simulate this through PRSIM, you'll need to add the production rules for the environment, right? the source and the sink. And then you can just you know, run PRSIM uh, on the output and set reset to one cycle, set reset to zero cycle, and it will just run, right? It is a valid, stable uh, production rule set, even though it's not CMOS implementable. Okay, uh, the other possible tool is Petrify. Now, Petrify takes a PetriNet specification that does not contain guards and can turn it into uh, a production rule set with uh, a particular timing assumption. So this is this takes PetriNets rather than HSE, and it uses the atomic complex gate assumption. The atomic complex gate assumption ultimately is effectively just fast inverters, uh, so that you don't have to worry about uh, putting an inverter on an isochronic fork. You just assume that the inverter is fast. Uh, which, if your layout, if you can guarantee that effectively in layout, then you're kind of fine. Um, and synchronous circuits tend to guarantee far more than that, right? Far worse than that in their layout, but they have a bunch of tools to do so, and we don't. So uh, this is kind of one of the main risks of using Petrify. Uh, but the 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 basic specification of the rule of the assumption is a tree of gates is assumed to transition completely before any of the inputs at the leaves of the tree are allowed to switch again. Right? So you draw a box around a tree of gates and you treat that as a single gate. And I in a certain way with an isochronic fork, you're also drawing the box around uh, around terminals, around the um, the output of a previous stage and the inputs of two su succeeding stages and saying, yes, these all transition within yep. uh, or simultaneously. So same kind of, uh, same high level way of specifying a timing assumption or thinking about timing assumption. All right, so this effectively assumes fast inverters and it, it gets around the CMOS implementability issue because you just stick inverters everywhere you want them. Um, how are sequence transitions different than what we did with this sequential series of transitions? They're not. It's just one of the cases that you have to deal with and that uh, HSC to PRS doesn't handle well. I see. Okay. Uh, and I guess it's some, somewhat more speculative question since this hasn't been implemented yet. Parallel transitions, the general idea is you then trace back the tree of preceding transitions and have to find a guard that is strong enough to pass both preceding uh, branches without while still being dis while still disambiguating between the branches maybe uh, it's unclear okay because I guess like these the rules do get written for uh, parallel transitions. Each individual rule gets written, uh, and each individual rule by itself is fine. But the moment that you go to stick them all together in a circuit, then that circuit will explode. At a certain level, this seems like a Boolean satisfiability problem, but those are also can be very complex. Yeah. Um, right. So there are a couple of ways to approach this, and one is to just take your uh, your predicate for all of the transitions, or them together, and then start trying to remove things and check it against all of the all of the states that they shouldn't fire in. Would that fall under guard weakening or is that still a kind of guard strengthening? That is guard weakening. And that would probably work just fine, uh, but it would take a lot longer. And it's unclear whether you'd get a better circuit out of it. 
are there also uh, optimality concerns? As in, when you've gone through the guard strengthening process, uh, is there other criteria for whether you've, construct, you've constructed anything that's extraneous? Or is it known that you won't construct anything that's extraneous? Uh, it is not known. All of So guard strengthening is largely a heuristic. Basically, it seems to work well in most cases. Uh, guard strengthening by itself is not proven to produce optimal results. Okay. Okay. Let's get into the examples. We have E1, which has, in which we take our example from the lecture, and we implement the set of production rules here, and we can watch it execute. Uh, and then we have E2, in which we uh, take a, you know, take that uh, kind of HSC or CHP to HSC and HSC to PRS flow to generate the production rules in the first place. So let's walk through each of those in turn, right? Okay, so if we, where are we? If we go back and we take these production rules and we can stick them into the ACT uh, process specification here, right? PRS, g.bdd, g.gnd. Right, these are our production rules that we've developed over the course of the lecture. And we can now run it, right? So I, I've got the source and sync set up here and here. We instantiate the streaming buffer, the source and the sync. And then in the uh, RC file, if we look at e1.rc, we handle reset, right? So we set a reset value for, for each of these signals uh, in the RC file directly. And so now we can see if we if we run make, uh, take a look at e1.act, we need to create the rules for v1 and v2. Run make. Now we have e1.prs, right? Which we can then simulate in uh, our PRSIM. source e1.rc and cycle and so you can see it runs uh there aren't any instabilities and it's a valid production rule set uh with respect to prsim if we take a look at example two we have our specification right with the channel uh we initialize r to zero and e to one in the channel we give it our uh send protocol in which we raise the request, lower the enable, lower the request, and then raise the wait for the enable to go high. Then we have the receive specification, right? The receive protocol, which we wait for the request to go high, lower the enable, wait for the request to go low, raise the enable. We have our process specification with two channels, one for L and one for R. We declare two internal nodes, V1 and V2, initializing them to zero and then we write out our HSC. Finally, we give it a specification for a, you know, the, the set of valid environments, which is just a source and a sync. So there's no particular synchronization rules between them. And we can run this through CHP to HSC, and it generates a uh, dot graph specification. So we can render this dot dash T P and G stream dot dot, uh, and then save that to stream dot png. Ah, we don't have dot in the broccoli command line interface. Note to self, fix that. And so this looks a lot like the, um, the HSC rendering that we were showing in uh, the later versions over the later versions have gotten more sophisticated. So later version removed these 
uh, null guards, right, which you can't actually execute. Um, and it cleans up the HSC in, in many different ways. So let's uh, then take a look at inside stream dot dot. And right, it's just a graph specification of the HSC in dot in dot's language. So we can take that and run it through HSC to PRS stream dot dot. And we just want to get down to the production rule, to the production rules, right? We don't want to try bubble reshuffling because that's next lecture. Uh, and so it runs and generates this stream invalid.prs. And we have our production rules. Now, HSC to PRS has a bunch of different options, which are the different stages in the uh, in the state basically in the formal synthesis process. Uh, one of them being uh, unique, right, which tries to insert state variables. Uh, I'm not sure if that works, but we can give it a try after I after we simulate these production rules. So if we take a look at stream invalid.prs, we go back to our lecture, we grab our rules for our environment, copy them in, and go ahead and run prsim stream invalid dot prs. So let's watch all. Set reset to one. Cycle. All right. So there's our reset. Set reset zero. Cycle. And again, this is a valid production rule system. Okay, so let's take our CHP to HSC specification uh, in e2.chp. And let's try removing these state variables. And let's see how this thing fares. All right, hc2 prs dash p e2 dot ch the dot actually stream dot dot. Let's remove some of these before we. Okay. All right, and so now we have these underscore SV signals, and it's used three state variables to disambiguate the state. Yes, with the uh, resets that it's inserting. Uh, I'm curious, so we didn't do that in the, uh, in the manual guard strengthening, and I'm just kind of curious if there's a particular uh, process behind the insertion of those resets. resets. So, so right now it just sticks a reset onto every single production rule dictated by the reset in specified in the HSC. So if we go back to our HSC that we were simulating, right, we have the reset values specified here, here, and here. So it just creates reset based on those. 